the use of ultrasound on blunt or penetrating trauma patients has been used since the early 90s to help direct care of our sickest patients. In combat casualty care settings, the role of ultrasonography continues to evolve. Military care providers currently use focused assessment with sonography and trauma, or FAST scans, for the rapid evaluation and triage of combat casualties. The goal of trauma care was pioneered by R. Adams Cali, who served as a surgeon in the Korean War. When he returned home to the United States, he realized we were taking better care of our victims on the battlefield than back at home. He discovered that if we could swiftly recognize and provide prompt and appropriate care, that our patients stood a better chance for survival. That golden hour of trauma, as it is commonly known, or the 60 minutes following injury when definitive care is crucial to a trauma patient's survival, is seen here on his gravestone. And in that golden hour of trauma, what tools did R. Adams Cowley have? Well, during his time, all he had was the physical exam initially. And that physical exam, as we know it today, is notoriously unreliable in the trauma patient. Then, the use of the diagnostic peritoneal lavage was implemented. However, the problem with the diagnostic peritoneal lavage, or DPL, is that there are a lot of false positives. It's very invasive, and it's limited to the abdomen. You cannot evaluate the chest, and you cannot evaluate the heart. So then came the CT scan. Now the CT scan is very sensitive and very specific. It's the most accurate imaging modality in trauma. However, you need a stable and a cooperative patient to sit still in the CT scanner. So the FAST exam, or focused assessment with sonography and trauma, while not as accurate as a CAT scan, it's certainly better than a DPL or the physical exam, which is why I consider it the best initial screening modality in trauma. You can do it at the bedside. You don't need a stable patient to perform it on. It's non-invasive. There's no DPL needle going into a patient. There's no radiation. And therefore, it's repeatable. Should your patient's vital signs suddenly change, you can just repeat the FAST exam. It's rapid. It only takes about three minutes to do a very complete FAST exam. And there's no contraindications. Even in a patient who has an obvious need for laparotomy, before they go off to the operating room, it's important to look at their heart and look in their chest to find other abnormalities. The indications to do a FAST exam, blunt or penetrating trauma to the abdomen or the chest. When you have a patient who's pregnant in the trauma bay, now you're really dealing with two patients. And anytime your patient suddenly becomes hypotensive, if you have unexplained hypotension, you can, help, you can use the FAST exam to help guide the next therapy. So it's not just for the abdomen anymore. It used to be called the focused abdominal sonography and trauma, but because we're evaluating other organs and other places in the body, we now call it the focused assessment of sonography and trauma. So we're looking for hemopericardium, hemoperitoneum, and hemothorax. The windows for the FAST exam, well, it starts in the right upper quadrant with the indicator pointed towards the patient's head. We look between the liver and the kidney. Then we move on to the heart. There's two views of the heart. One where you look in a subxiphoid view or underneath uh, the sternum, and the other one where you're looking parasternally or in that third or fourth intercostal space. And then we're looking in the left upper quadrant between the spleen and the kidney with the indicator pointing towards the head. And then finally, we're looking in the pelvis. We do a two view of the pelvis, a transverse and a sagittal. In the right upper quadrant or hepatorenal window, we're looking in a coronal plane with the indicator towards the patient's head. Now it's not just a static window, but you really do need to fan uh, anteriorly and posteriorly getting through all potential windows of that Morrison's pouch. That hepatorenal window or Morrison's pouch is the interface of the liver on the kidney. Now this is the most dependent portion of the peritoneal cavity and so in a supine patient, this is the most likely site that you will find blood. And again, it's not just a static window. Instead, you're moving from the diaphragm superiorly all the way down through the lower pole of the kidney inferiorly. When that lower pole of the kidney comes halfway down your ultrasound window, now you've got the entire fast scan of that window. 
And this is what it looks like when it's positive. We have the liver, we have the kidney, and you can see some anechoic fluid layering out this sharp angle of fluid here layering out between the liver and the kidney. And that's a positive FAST exam when you see that. Moving on to the heart, the two views of the heart, one is the subxiphoid view. Now the subxiphoid view can be a challenging window to obtain and uh, what you want to do is start in that right upper quadrant looking at the liver actually because re recall that we're going to be using the liver in order to see the heart. So if the sound isn't first going through the liver, we're not going to be able to see the heart through the subxiphoid window. So in patients who have very small livers, this is a very difficult, if not impossible, window to obtain. You're going to start at that liver edge and follow it up through that subcostal margin, aiming the beam at the chin until you see uh, the heart come onto the screen. And when you do so, it appears as this. You can see a four-chambered view of the heart. First thing we see is the liver. As I mentioned, the sound first has to go through the liver. Then it goes into the right ventricle and then finally it makes its way posteriorly into the left ventricle. And then the right atrium is seen on the left side of the window, and here is the left atrium. So it's a four-chambered view, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, and we can see the interventricular septum between here. The pericardium, as I've traced it out here, comes around the apex and then posteriorly back here. That's the pericardium. That's where we're going to be looking for fluid. As we can see on the window over here, we can see that there's a pericardial effusion, this anechoic separation between the anterior pericardium and the myocardium. In fact, it traces itself around the apex and posteriorly as well. Now about 15% of the time, we are simply unable to obtain a subxiphoid view of the heart. And therefore, we have to choose another window, and the one we choose is the parasternal long. The parasternal long, as its name suggests, you're right adjacent to the sternum, maybe a centimeter off the sternum, and then you're going to align the sound along the long axis of the heart. When you can get that sound to go along the long axis of the heart, then you have the parasternal long window. And when we're going from the subxiphoid view to the parasternal long view, all we do is simply aim the indicator towards the patient's left elbow. And this is the cardiology orientation of the image on the screen. We can see here that the indicator, noted by that red dot, is aimed down towards the patient's left elbow. And this will create the image on the screen that is in the cardiology orientation, or so that the apex is over here on this side of the screen. This dot right here corresponds to the indicator, and since we aimed that indicator towards the patient's left elbow, the apex appears on this side of the screen, whereas the great vessels appear on this side of the screen. In fact, this is the left atrium here. We can see the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. This is the left ventricle, so the blood's going to come from the left atrium through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and then out the aortic outflow tract. In fact, this is the two valves here seen of the aortic valve here on this aortic outflow tract, and this is the aortic root here. And then finally, anteriorly, we can see the right ventricle. You can see how close the right ventricle is to the skin line. It's only about a centimeter and a half deep from uh, the chest wall. Over here is just the moving video of the same. Left atrium, blood goes into the left ventricle, out the aortic outflow tract, and then the right ventricle. Now, moving on to the left upper quadrant, it looks just like the right upper quadrant, except now instead of the liver, we have the spleen. We aim the indicator towards the patient's head, and we obtain this spleno-renal view. And the area that we're looking for anechoic fluid to layer out is in between here, the spleen and the kidney. Now the problem with the left upper quadrant is sometimes we have a, the stomach in the way, and the stomach can be filled with fluid or air. When there's air, air looks like this, it looks very hyperechoic. When there's air in the stomach, we don't make much of it, uh, but when there's fluid in the stomach, the danger is that, especially in an unstable patient, we could mistake uh, there being free fluid when there's actually fluid in the stomach, which is not free fluid. So just keep that in mind. You need to obtain a very posterior view in order to get 
the spleen and the kidney to come in contact with one another. You need to have these two organs on the screen at the same time and you will not make that mistake of calling free fluid actually fluid in the stomach. What we're seeing here is a positive left upper quadrant view. This is actual free fluid seen between the spleen and the kidney. And this free fluid, this anechoic wedge of fluid here is seen between these two organs and not in the stomach. Because I see both these organ on, uh, organs on the screen, I know that I've obtained this correct window. And then finally, we move on to the suprapubic view. The first window we do is a sagittal view, where we have the indicator aimed towards the patient's head, just above this pubic symphysis. And we're going to fan side to side through that bladder window, looking for any anechoic wedges of free fluid that may be posterior to or adjacent to the bladder. Here's what it looks like in the female pelvis. We see the bladder. Over here, this bladder is relatively empty. As this bladder fills, it will push the fundus of the uterus this way. Uh, this is the vaginal stripe. This line down here is seen as the vaginal stripe. This is the cervix over here. And then this antiverted uterus wraps itself anteriorly. So fluid can accumulate between the uterus and the bladder, or the anterior cul-de-sac, or fluid can accumulate posteriorly, this recto-uterine pouch or pouch of Douglas back here. And then you get a transverse view, aiming the indicator towards the patient's right. We get a transverse view, and we're going to fan superiorly and inferiorly through that bladder to look for any wedges of anechoic free fluid seen adjacent to or posterior to the bladder. This is an example here of a full bladder, and adjacent to this bladder is this anechoic wedge of free fluid. We see it right next to the bladder here. And that anechoic wedge of free fluid is seen adjacent to our nice full bladder. We can make it out very well. There's some loops of bowel lateral to that free fluid. But that's what it looks like. It's a sharp angle of anechoic fluid seen adjacent to the bladder. This is an example here, fanning through the bladder. First they did transverse, and now they're going sagittal. And if we look in that sagittal plane, just posterior to the bladder, we see some anechoic wedges of free fluid seen just down here. Maybe not appreciated very well in the transverse views, but as we move over to sagittal, it becomes a little more obvious. See that right behind the bladder there? There's some free fluid right there. Now we're going to talk about how to actually perform the FAST exam. So the FAST exam has four major windows. The first window of the FAST exam is Morrison's pouch. And with the indicator towards the patient's head, we place the probe at about the 10th intercostal space. And what we're going to do is we're going to need to slide the probe superior and inferior, and then we're going to be fanning the probe anterior and posterior in order to see all the way through the interface of the liver and the kidney. The next window of the FAST exam is the sub xiphoid view of the heart. We start at the liver. We use the liver as our window to see the heart. We start over here at the liver, and then we slide up into the sub xiphoid notch. I've got my indicator towards the patient's right, and the cable is exiting the bottom of my hand. And I'm fanning, and I'm applying more pressure, and as the patient takes a deep breath, the heart comes right down towards my transducer. And then the next window of the FAST exam is the parasternal long window of the heart. I place the probe with my indicator towards the patient's left hip. I place the probe right on the sternum, and then I simply slide off until I see this long axis of the heart come down my screen. We're getting a long axis view of the heart with the indicator towards the patient's left hip. The next window of the FAST exam involves the spleno-renal view. With the indicator towards the patient's head, I'm over this area of the 10th intercostal space with the indicator towards the patient's head mid-axillary line, and I'm sliding superiorly and inferiorly, trying to get the entire contents of the spleno-renal window in my view, and I'm fanning anteriorly and posteriorly until I get the optimal window. 
Recall that the stomach lies anterior to the spleen, so if I fan too far anteriorly, I'm going to have that stomach in my view, and I really may need to fan more posteriorly, sometimes sliding the probe posteriorly. And the final window of the FAST exam is the suprapubic window. This window is comprised of a transverse view with the indicator of the patient's right, and then a sagittal view with the indicator of the patient's head. In each of these windows, transverse and sagittal, I'm going to be fanning all the way from side to side and anterior, and I should say superior and inferior in order to obtain this complete window. Now, in order to rule out a hemothorax, what we need to do is look above the diaphragm. You see, as the sound comes through the liver and encounters the diaphragm in somebody who has a chest that has no fluid in it, then what happens is the sound traverses along the diaphragm and eventually makes its way back to the probe. And because the sound spent extra time in the body, the machine thinks that there's something further afield and it plots the material that the sound was running through, which was the liver, further afield or above the diaphragm. And we have this mirror image of the liver here seen above the diaphragm. Now if there's fluid in the chest, we would lose that mirror image and instead we would see anechoic material here. So this is called the mirror image artifact and when you see the mirror image artifact of the liver or on the left side the spleen, above the diaphragm, where it appears as though there's liver or spleen up in the chest, then you can say with very good accuracy that there's no fluid in that patient's chest. When we see this side by side, we can tell that on the image on the left with a positive hemothorax, we've lost the mirror image artifact. There's anechoic material seen superior to the diaphragm which tells us this patient has fluid, or in the setting of trauma, likely blood in their chest. So when I see black stuff on the screen, I think about fluid. And then I think about where is it? Is it above the diaphragm, or is it between the kidney and the liver? In this case, the, dis the area between the kidney and the liver is without any anechoic material, whereas the anechoic material seen on the screen is above the diaphragm and we've lost the mirror image artifact. That confirms that this is a hemothorax. Now there's some pitfalls you need to watch out for at the FAST exam. Keep in mind that epicardial fat can separate the pericardium from the myocardium. And it's seen in many normal individuals, but your eye is drawn to it. Because you see that separation on the screen, your eye becomes drawn to the area between the pericardium and the myocardium. But just keep in mind that a pericardial effusion or hemopericardium should appear anechoic or jet black, whereas epicardial fat is heterochoic and is tacked down to the heart so it moves with the heart as the heart is beating. Now the problem is when you get to a clot around the heart because a clot is neither anechoic or heterogeneic. It's um, completely isoechoic, or it's the same echogenicity as the liver, you could think, or as the thyroid. It's got this very fine isoechoic texture to it. This is what a clot looks like. So a clot looks like this anywhere in the body. This happens to be a pericardial clot. So this is the, this is the pericardium out here. This is the liver. So we're doing a subxiphoid view. This is the right ventricle over here, and the left ventricle is seen down here. And here's this clot that is separating the myocardium from the pericardium. Now, if you look off to the right here, you'll see these centimeter hash marks. So one, two, three, maybe even four centimeters. This is like a four centimeter separation between the pericardium and the myocardium. And that's another way to help distinguish this from a fat pad. An epicardial fat pad is rarely more than one centimeter. And so because this is four centimeters, that helps us also confirm to us because of that and the fact that it's so isochoic that this is a pericardial clot. 
The other pitfall I briefly mentioned was that there could be fluid in the stomach, um, and you could mistake that as free fluid. Here's an example of fluid seen down here in the stomach. Here's the spleen, and here's the kidney. Notice that there's something anechoic on the screen, and the question you ask yourself is, is it layering out between the spleen and the kidney, which it is not. In fact, it's separate. It's over here in a separate structure in the stomach. If there was a further question, you could always put an NG tube in the patient and uh, remove that fluid. When I put these two structures side by side one another, we can see that the image on the left where we have the hemopericardium, there's a sharp angle that wedges out between the spleen and the kidney. And the image on the right, the area between the spleen and the kidney is dry and there's fluid in the stomach. So in terms of what to do with the patient who's got a positive FAST exam or negative FAST exam, this is a generally accepted algorithm. If the patient's got a positive FAST exam, there's blood in their abdomen, and the patient is unstable, then that is an indication to do an exploratory laparotomy. If the patient has a positive FAST exam but they're stable, then you can get them to CT scan. It's important to quickly move them to CT scan because this may be your only window of stability in which to do that. Now, if the patient has a negative FAST exam and they're stable, then most of the time they get a CT scan. If the patient's got a negative FAST exam but they're unstable, then you need to think about what could cause a patient to be unstable in the setting of a negative FAST exam. Other things come to mind such as an intracranial bleeding injury where you have loss of the vasomotor tone. The same thing happens with the spinal cord injury. If you have bleeding in the retroperitoneum, you won't see that on the FAST exam. Or if you have a very bad pelvic fracture, you wouldn't see that on the FAST exam. Or you could have bleeding into another space, such as the thigh. If you have a bad long bone fracture, you could lose a lot of blood there, or maybe a bad scalp laceration, lose a lot of blood there, and you could be hypotensive, unstable, but have a negative FAST exam. But one thing to keep in mind is that the FAST exam only has about an 85% sensitivity to pick up any amount of free fluid in the abdomen. Here's a case. This is a 38-year-old male who came in in blunt traumatic full arrest. He was driving a car. He was not wearing a seatbelt. He hit a tree. And when the paramedics got to him, he had a pulse there uh, in the field and in the ambulance. But when he arrived in our trauma bay, he did not have a pulse. In fact, we felt no carotid pulse at all on this gentleman and uh, no femoral pulses. But when we looked at his heart on the FAST exam, we saw this. Even in this patient who had no pulse, we saw prominent cardiac motion. But the diagnosis here is pericardial tamponade. And when you see the setting of pericardial tamponade in a blunt trauma victim, the next step in the, in the management of this patient is to do an immediate thoracotomy. Despite presenting with blunt traumatic full arrest, we realized this patient had pericardial tamponade on the ultrasound, we did a bedside thoracotomy, and this patient survived to discharge. Here's a 37-year-old male who was stabbed in the left chest. We can see the stab wound over there by his left nipple. As opposed to the previous patient, this guy actually looked very stable. He had no past medical history. He was alert and oriented, really no acute distress. His uh, vital signs didn't look too bad. He did have some JVD, but otherwise um, his lungs were clear. I could hear his heart very well. And so Beck's triad, or JVD, muffled heart tones, and hypotension, was not present on this patient who was stabbed in his left chest. But we did a fast exam on him, even though he looked very stable, and we're looking at his heart and the parasternal long axis, we actually saw that this gentleman had a prominent pericardial effusion wrapping all the way around his heart. This is seen anteriorly, and this is posteriorly. This is in the parasternal long axis with our indicator towards his left elbow. We can see the apex of the heart. This is his left ventricle here. 
we see the left atrium here, his uh, aortic outflow tract. Now this is where his right ventricle is. It's very small here because he has a, a large pericardial effusion that's, that is uh, reducing the ability for blood to enter into his right ventricle. That's why we see a very small right ventricle here. Even with stable vital signs, someone can have a large pericardial effusion. And this is another indication in the setting of trauma to do a thoracotomy. Here's a 17-year-old male who came in with auto versus pedestrian. And we're doing the suprapubic window here. And we can see that adjacent to his bladder, there is free fluid. So we call this free fluid in the suprapubic window right adjacent to his bladder. Now I mentioned that Morrison's pouch is the most dependent portion of the peritoneal cavity. But it also depends how a patient was sitting or lying before the paramedics got there. And so in this case, this patient was sitting in an upright position for quite some time. Uh, and then the paramedics, uh, the fire department, extricated him. They brought him to the, to the trauma bay where he had a significant amount of free fluid adjacent to his bladder. And his Morrison's pouch was actually negative. To increase the sensitivity of the FAST exam, you can put the patient into Trendelenburg, and that will help get some of this fluid up into Morrison's pouch where it's easier to see. We're lucky in this case that we can see it prominently, but if it was a smaller amount of free fluid with all these loops of bowel here, it may be difficult to pick out the free fluid, which is why I'm a favor of that Trendelenburg move. Here's a 28-year-old male who was stabbed multiple times in the chest and abdomen and we're doing our FAST exam. This is the, um, the right upper quadrant view. We can see the liver here. Uh, I don't see the kidney anywhere on the screen, but I do see some anechoic material. So right off the bat, I see some anechoic fluid on the right side. Um, I'm looking, this is all the diaphragm here. It's above the diaphragm, it's superior to the diaphragm, therefore, this is in the chest. I've lost that mirror image artifact, and this is what a hemothorax looks like. To continue this window, I'd want to come down and see the interface of the liver on the kidney, but just in this particular window here, I can confirm the diagnosis of a hemothorax. This is a 56-year-old male who fell 25 feet, and we're doing the suprapubic window, and what I first think is the bladder here actually is not the bladder. This is just a lot of free fluid. In fact, I don't see his bladder anywhere. We want to put a Foley in him, and uh, blood came out of the Foley catheter, and we later found out he had a ruptured bladder. But these are all loops of bowel here sitting in this free fluid in his pelvis. So this is free fluid seen in the suprapubic window, though no bladder is seen. Here's another case. This is a 19-year-old male who had a transmediastinal gunshot wound to the chest. And we can see here that this is a parasternal long view of the heart. Well, how do I know this is a parasternal lung? Well, if I look at the top of the screen here, I don't see anything that looks like the liver, so therefore this is just chest wall. And in fact, we can see that the distance from the chest wall down into this pericardium here is only about a centimeter, maybe a centimeter and a half or so. And so we can see this fluid, several centimeters here of a fluid collection that's going around the apex of the heart and posteriorly, which tells us that this is what hemopericardium looks like on a parasternal long. Here's a 29-year-old female. She was in a rollover motor vehicle collision with a prolonged extrication, and we saw this fast exam. We did the right upper quadrant, and we can see the liver and the kidney. There's no fluid between the liver and the kidney. This is a dry Morrison's pouch, but we look up into her chest, and we see that she has a hemothorax up there on the right side. Here's a 46-year-old female. She fell down a long flight of stairs. And she was hypotensive. And we're expecting to see a positive FAST exam. Instead, we see this. This is just a normal FAST exam, a normal mirror image artifact up, up here above the diaphragm. We can see the liver up in her chest. And we see the kidney and the liver. There's no fluid between those two organs there. And the reason for her hypotension, we found out later, was that she had a spinal cord injury. 
Here's a 29-year-old female. She's a passenger. She was T-boned on her side at about 30 miles per hour. And what we see here is the spleen. We see the kidney down here. And we can see this free fluid here only along the lower pole of the kidney. So if I was only focused up here on that uh, upper pole, mid pole of the kidney, I could potentially have missed this free fluid that was hiding more inferiorly. That's why I say it's important to obtain a full window, whether you're looking at the right upper quadrant or left upper quadrant, you get as far as north as the diaphragm, and you come all the way down south to the lower pole of the kidney. When that lower pole of the kidney comes halfway down your ultrasound screen, then you've completed that window. Here's a 56-year-old male. He was a seat-belted rear passenger in a rollover motor vehicle collision. And right off the bat, our eye is drawn to the area between his kidney and his liver. And we see this hyperechoic area here. It's heterogenic, it's hyperechoic, and that's simply a perinephric fat pad. We see them all the time on normal individuals, and there's no clinical significance of it whatsoever, but your eye is drawn to it. But remember, it's not anechoic, it's not free fluid, it's hyperechoic, it's heterogenic, it's fat. Here's a 29-year-old male. He was auto versus pedestrian. We can see his bladder here, prostate back here, and as we go through this transverse window, don't see any free fluid yet. Oh, and then I come down in fairly enough, and there's that fluid hiding just posterior to his bladder. Back here. So we see bladder, free fluid, and this is prostate seen back here behind the bladder. There it is again. Bladder, prostate, and it's not until we come really in fairly that we actually make out where that free fluid is. I'm gonna fan all the way through. That's the importance of fanning all the way through a structure. We would have missed it initially had we not fanned it, and then had we not gone to that other view, the sagittal view here. So we can see the bladder is more triangular in that sagittal view. So to summarize the FAST exam, it's the hepatorenal or right upper quadrant, it's the cardiac view doing a sub xiphoid and then a parasternal long. It's the splenorenal view, or left upper quadrant, and it's a suprapubic view, both a sagittal and a transverse plane. This concludes the presentation.